Here we are for another Lombardi Live, a very special one for me. My guest today is a producer, he's a songwriter, obviously he's a drummer, but much more than that, he's a percussionist on the drum set. And that's something we're gonna talk about because it's very important for your career and it's been an important part of his career too. Stephen Perkins, thank you for joining me. Thank you and thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah. And it's an honor to be here with you, Don, and surrounded by our heroes. Yeah, well, looking around here, it's just so much inspiration in this building, and thank you for having me. No, my, my pleasure for sure. Uh, we have such a history to go back to. Um, in, in, in the history, I remember getting a call about adding a timpani off to the side of my drum set. What, what did we accomplish on it? We, we put a pedal on it? it was That's true. <laughs> so with, uh, when Jane's Addiction broke up, Porn of Papyrus was around the corner. And I thought, I really wanted to take the drum set and color it. Because with Jane's, John Good taught me, I don't need 12, 13, 16, go 8, 10, 12, 14. And the melody started to show up and unveil themselves. With porno, I thought, what would be the next step? So I added a, a timbali, some bongos, uh, another, I think on the on set of a floor tom, I had a timbali on each side, yeah, that's right, and drums up here and bongos. And I thought the timpani part that I was playing in the recording sessions, wouldn't that be great if I can replicate that on stage? So you built a pedal and you helped me, uh, you know, figure out the, the possibilities, of course, of the left foot working the timpani pedal. Right. And it was maybe six feet away. So, I mean, the, the leverage we had to have and the torque was just incredible. But it felt so smooth. And I became so ambidextrous with my left hand and my right hand forced to become a more musical player. And that's what kind of what I was going for with the drum set is to add color, to add more lyrical. Obviously, the, the frequencies from high to low are so, you know, different in a drummer's world. You can have the little high-pitched bell at the very top and an 808 sub at the low, and you can hit those together and achieve so much on the frequency of the mix. So the timpani really brought this round experience, I think, for the listener through the PA, because the, the drums have this punch and this attack. And when you go to the timpani, it's more of this air moving. So the, the pedal itself still works. Me and my tech, Mike, uh, Mike Grisiak, we found all the parts, we oiled it up, we tuned it back in, and Porn for Pyros is going out in February, so I'm bringing that timpani back out. We're having issues finding a case for it, because I sold all my cases 20 <laughs> years ago, because you, you buy a bunch of stuff, and then you realize they're sitting in storage, and you don't need them anymore. So uh, we will be bringing the timpani back out, and I was just talking to the stage manager what my footprint's going to be on stage because my drum set itself is eight by eight you add that the pedal and the timpani it's another four or six feet to the left so uh, you're going to see a massive community of drums on the porn of pyro stage which you know and a history oh. about how they happen to come to be too <laughs> yeah just, exactly now you know the warranty and, is almost out on the timpani pedal so you better get it back to well, me if you need a new <laughs> pair on so it was only a 40-year warranty yeah, well you know the funny thing is i bought that timpani straight from ludwig you, you uh, sized it up with the pedal. And then Mick Fleetwood had a big sale at Third Encore here in Los Angeles. And I bought one of the Mick Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac timpanis. So I have that at home. So now I have two timpanis, one fitted with a pedal. And it's just a beautiful musical instrument. And I always find when you get a new snare drum, if you're lucky enough, and or some new cymbals, or perhaps a, a percussion instrument as large as a, a timpani or small as a bongo, it changes your ideas of what rhythms can do and how small or large the rhythms can be and how they connect to each other. And I spend a lot of time with my drum set and listening to the different sounds like Bozio or Neil Peart or some of the drummers that had the bigger drum sets. Why are they there? What's the purpose of having these different sounds? And it's about real estate in the mix. What part of the mix do you want to use and bring attention to while the listener is experiencing this? Now, I love going to a movie, and there's so much. There's the dialogue. There's the Foley sounds. There's the music. And the mixing job is just so important for a movie. And same with rock and roll music or jazz music or, or R&B and hip-hop. 
you you start with the the kick drum and the bass and it has to have a highway they can feel and the vocals and the cymbals and a little bit of the keyboards can be above them kind of tinkling down and then the punch you know the song has to punch you right in the face so i always think about this when i'm playing my drums and back to the timpani that brings a sound so foreign to rock music it's more of an orchestral drum and it's tuned to the orchestra or the symphonic moment so i love bringing those sounds timbali bongo timpani into the rock and roll you know the punch of rock and roll but have these different flavors from the drummer and i think we're so lucky as drummers we can play punk rock we can play jazz we can play reggae and that's all in one song you know what I mean? We can pull from anywhere and put that into our drumming. And I think that's what my favorite part of finding new drummers is trying to figure out what music they listen to and how they got there. You know, why do they play it that, that way? That and they're listening style. to you, by the way. Well, that's good to know. You know, it's, it's good to know when you make music and you're influencing the people around you. And you, in L.A., of course, I was born and raised, so many players. It's just saturated with musicians. And you bump into people that affected you and you affected them. And then one day you get to work together and you can affect more people, you know, and inspire people. A project I worked on with you, which is so aptly named, Hands, Feet, Mind, and Soul. Yeah. Uh, that's such an important part of your life and your career, I know. Um, and how you bring that to all the young drummers that are out there in terms of your philosophy about that. Absolutely. You know, I'm lucky because my dream was to drum. And it came true. So I wake up and I take care of my body. I eat well, I exercise, but all because I want to play good. I want to get on the drum set, feel good and feel creative. And I think keeping your body and your, somehow your spirit lifted, because we all are going to get bad news. But we all get good news too, but the good news goes quick. The bad news somehow seeps in deeper and, and it stays with you. So my job as a drummer and as a musician, as an entertainer, is to wake you up and feel the good news. And I think I realized that as a young drummer, I, I learned the beginning of a Van Halen song. It's a cowbell part. And it was left-handed cowbell with hi-hat. And I was so proud to show everybody. And my friends came over and I saw them beaming. And I'm like, this is cool. Because not only I put the time in to learn something, and, and I hit the top of the pyramid, I got the target, I did it. But now I'm sharing this and I'm seeing people heal. They're actually healing from this. They're feeling good. They're getting away from any pain, any bad news. They're dancing to my drum beat. So that infuses not only, yeah, I want to have great chops. I want to have great technique. I want to understand different time signatures. But what's the point of playing is to make people feel it and feel good. And make them think and provoke thought. And some of the great drummers in my you know, record collection, sometimes the song comes second. It's the rhythms that I'm attracted to. And I don't even notice there's a song sometimes. I'm just listening to this great drum part. And I want my drum parts and when I play for people to experience the air moving because you're hitting something and air is moving. And the digital drums today, which is great because you're, you're, you're hitting a, a mesh head, but you're still hitting something, which is nice, you know? It's not like using an octopad with eight targets. You're actually hitting a head. But when you're moving air and people feel that, I think it does heal the soul. I think it takes you out of your normal everyday experience. We all have songs. It's weird when like a, a Stones or a Beatles song can cross the globe and everyone knows it and loves it. One song everyone can feel, Imagine by John Lennon. How does one song change the world? It's like a math, it's like Einstein. You know, he shows you something and the whole world goes, oh, of course, this is how it's supposed to work. So I think music can actually do that. It can change the, the, the way we think. And the drummer has that power. I love the small shows, the baked potato, and everyone's watching you. But I love the big shows where no one can even see you, and, but they can feel you and they're moving, you know? And it's almost more uh, impressive on, on Mother Nature not to be seen and just heard. And I think that's the great thing about drumming is connecting my hands, my feet, my heart, my soul, 
and somehow freeing other people. You know, I, I think about the great Bruce Lee. Like I just said, Einstein. Bruce Lee plus Einstein equals Neil Peart, <laughs> right? I mean, perfect physical form and and perfect understanding of what, the science of what he's doing. And I just love that. And that's what turns me on. It's there's a science to it, but there's also a personality. You can bring your own personality to drumming, and two plus two can be five in drumming, in my opinion. You can really change things and change people's opinions with music. And if you think about the simple click track, one, two, three, four, there's so much between the one and the two. One, two, all that between time. That's what I'm after, uh, you know? And when you see people dance, they don't dance on the beat, they dance between the beat. And a drummer has to be aware of what's going on between the beat, on the beat, after the beat, before the beat, no beat. And it's just a great, uh, if, if you could take the time and, and, and breathe and get past, you know, I want to be fast, I want to show off, I want to do tricks. I mean, that's all fun and games. But what's the point of playing is to make people feel it. And, and that's what, you know, my favorite drummers do to me. There's a new drummer. I don't know her name, and the band just got a gig opening for the Peppers, but I've been following this band for a while, Otto, Otto Bucky Beaver. And she's a wonderful drummer, and what I saw her do has changed. Every time I sit on the drum set now, she might be 19, and from Tokyo, and I don't know what her record collection is, it really doesn't matter, but what she did on that hi-hat pattern has changed me permanently. Now when I go to my kit, I think about her, and how do I, how do I get to the point where you can break ground and still make, she's doing what I did to people. She's making me feel good. That's what I did to my friends with the Van Halen cowbell. So that's what I'm after is, is finding more drummers that turn me on and turning more people on with my drumming. And it does come from the heart and the soul. The hands and the feet, you know, that's all technique. There's a great romance to drumming because I can buy a you know, stick control book it's possible these guys had the same book. You know, I can buy a, a, a syncopation, you know, the, the book that you read is the same book I read, so there's a romance because we, we study the same art, but then what do we do with it, you know? That's, how do you become Buddy Rich? I know Frank and Buddy, supposedly, they room together. I don't know if they got along, but those are the two of the greatest, you know, the hands and voice of all time, and and it's like, that's really the, the charm of, of what you do with these, these sticks and what you do with your own personal life and how to express that. You know, I never got to hang out with Neil much. I heard he wasn't into so much meeting new people. He had his own circle. I think you met him here a couple yeah, times. Yeah, a handshake or two. But I didn't need to know the guy to like, yeah, both, the, both the of influence you, is so massive. <laughs> something that you share, I think, is that both of you somewhat orchestrate your drum parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have very well-known fills and beats that you have in your songs. I'm happy you brought that up. People will air drum and cop, and yeah. that, that's fine with you. Uh, well, this is great, because Jane's Addiction original bass player, Eric Avery, is back in the band. Now in high school, I used to date his sister, so I was 14 when I met Eric. So he's been in my life, my whole life. At North Hollywood High School. Uh, well, it's, no, this is, this uh, is in uh, Notre Dame High Notre School. Notre Dame yeah. High School. Yeah, where, they were, where they had no band, by yeah. the way. <laughs> That's right. So I, uh, you know, I'm dating this girl. I meet her older brother. And he writes great songs. And he doesn't so much want to show off on the bass. He wants to show you a, a song. And then he says, what kind of drum beat could you write to this song? Let's not change it, you know. To me, his bass lines are a haiku. There's five syllables. You don't move them around. That's what it is, you know, and that's the bass line. So he sent me some bass lines last, about a month ago. I've got my home studio, and I just was so happy to chase a drum beat. And at the end of Monday, I wasn't happy. The end of Tuesday, I was almost there. Wednesday, Thursday, but all it is is a drum beat. What is it? It's air, it's me striking something and not striking. It's not really something you can hold. But years later, people can feel it. I have a song called Pets by Porn for Pyros. People ask me about that drum beat to this day. So I think a dr writing a drum beat is 
a great achievement. Writing a drum beat that people can feel and dance to, and, and if you think about what, you know, take five, you know, if you think about sing, 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 you know, the, 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 the beats that still hold 60, 70 years later, they still hold a place in my heart, you know, Tom Sawyer, you know, and you think about how important those beats are, and it's just a drum beat, but it really is all I'm here to do is write drum beats and to marry the beats with the lyric. There's a song called Pete's Dad that Porn of a Pirate was releasing. Perry wrote song, a lyric about Peter's father who was sick. I had to think that way when I wrote the beat. Like, what is this about? You know, why are we singing about this? What's the miracle of Christmas? And, then, and that's the song. So I, I, I felt part of the song. It's not just a drum beat. It's a musical conversation. Something that's really important, I think, and you've mentioned it here, and we've mentioned it a couple times on some earlier shows we had on Drum Channel just recently, that space between the beats. <laughs> so there is the beat which you can write out, and you could reproduce it by reading what's written out, but making it feel like you're not reading it, putting your own interpretation into it, if yeah. you will, yeah. uh, is what makes your version of that beat a little different than somebody else's, but still makes it feel right. Yeah, I love comparing drummers I love comparing drummers playing the same beat. Uh, it's just a, it's just a laugh. Or the same you know? song. Yeah, the same song exactly. You know, there is no right or wrong. It's just how, how do they go about it? And I was I was talking to uh, a young drummer about John Bonham and Stuart Copeland, and I said Bonham is is leaning backwards, and if you say the word one, two, three, four, one, there's a O, a N, and an E. Bonham hears the one on the E. Copeland hears the one on the O. You know, I mean, it's just a word, one, but it takes a long time to say it or think it. And there's a lot going on, even on that one beat. You get one or one at the end of it. So it, there's so much power and stretch, like almost like a taffy machine. A drummer could be aware of that and stretch the feel and swing the feel. And, and even if you're not playing the, the ghost notes, you feel them and you hear them in yourself. And that kind of makes the beat, you know, it, it just, like you're walking in snow or sand or grass, you're still walking. But there's a different feel and your body feels different when it does it and you adjust. And I think a drummer has that ability to really examine and dissect the feel of a song I did a great session with uh, Rick Rubin, one of the great producers of all time. He's talking in my ears, but no one else is hearing what he's saying. So I did a take, and then he said, Perkins, next take, think about if you were in Jamaica, same song. And he didn't tell the other band members. He didn't know he was asking, because you, you definitely yeah, got, exactly you, you you go got there. that vibe. You, you're there. <laughs> yeah, I could go there. But he didn't tell anybody else. So we did a second take, and all of a sudden I'm playing differently. Other musicians are looking at me, what's happening? I was pleasing the producer. He was after a drum part. He was after a, a, a jarring moment for the band, a change. And the next time he said, next, this one, lean forward. So he was making notes on the takes, and I don't know what happened, which ones he used, if he, if he somehow comped them together or what he did. But it was interesting, he was feeding me notes, but not the other musicians. And the notes were about the feel. And it wasn't about speed up, slow down. It was about where are you? Are you in Jamaica or are you in, you know, are you in uh, Birmingham, England? You know, think about where you are and what, how you can approach that. So that that was a cool production moment. You know, a great way to direct you. That's yeah. the genius of those guys. Absolutely, yeah, for sure, for sure. A great uh, another moment. Bob Ezrin, one of the great producers, he did Pink Floyd, The Wall. I said, can I get that drum sound? He said, you hit too hard. If you want that drum sound, you got to hit very softly. We'll have the mics nice and hot, but you like to pound, you know? So it's like, it's a different sound. So it just it made me realize some of the things I might want and I'm chasing, there's an education to get there. You just can't just, it doesn't just happen, you know? And you have professionals like you or, or Rick Rubin or Bob Ezrin explain how we got there and, and make it easier for us to navigate, you know, how to get through it. No, with the... The course that we work together on that's on Drum Channel, I think it's so educational, the uh, hands, feet, mind, and soul, because you actually took tracks from Jane's Addiction. That's right. And breaks them down. The most important part of breaking it down isn't 
knowing how to play the beat. That's the how to do it. But it's why you did it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, that's the missing link that's going to turn you from being a great drummer, as you're saying, into really being a musician. Right. I, I, it's, I don't play drums. I play music. Drums are the vehicle, you know? And don't forget that. We're, we're musicians. Um, you know, there's something great about the, the power of a drum machine for a songwriter. And he can write. But there's no conversation between him and the rhythmist. So, as a rhythmist, we want to like impress our our moments where you don't step on someone, but you can, like I say, pull the taffy. You know, you've got to hang out with Ringo and Charlie and and the guys that you know. The whole world has danced to these. The world has danced to these drummers. And uh, I was talking to the Grateful Dead drummers, Mickey and Billy. How many hips have you guys moved? You know what I mean? That's just a wonderful feeling. To, because you help the world feel better, you know? And that's such a great job of a drummer, is like bringing people together to dance. I think um, someone said it when they saw Woodstock, you don't see that many people together unless it's a concert or a battlefield. I choose concert, you know? <laughs> Let's go. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, speaking of bands you've been in, mm -hmm. we're kind of going down this direction. Uh, there's another band that you were in. Elias, I'm gonna have you play a little clip here for for Steve. What's the difference between that and playing in a band band? Well, I love the, the conversation that drummers can have with each other because you, you set your, your pattern and then you hear someone else affect that. You can't help yourself but to kind of maneuver and you keep maneuvering. And I think that's the kind of like a, uh, and like a, nearly an ant trail. When you see all the ants going together, you know there's a pattern there and they're all moving in the same direction. But when you get close, you can see there's there's chaos, but far away and, and organically, it just feels right. And drum circles in LA, growing up, I used to hear them in Venice. And as a youngster, I wouldn't join them, but I would watch and I would hear this rumble. And it sounded, I guess, in a sense, like a, a celebration, which is strange, you know? A bunch of drummers banging. Tribish. But it, yeah, but it's a celebration. It doesn't, you're not going to battle. And you're not you're not going to like bring people into like this anger mode. It's a celebration. I love that about drumming. It makes you want to jump and hop, 
And Jane's Addiction always opens the show. I have Baba Tundi Alatunji recordings. So I have Baba Tundi African drumming for at least 20 minutes before we hit the stage. And usually we start at, six, at 60 dB. Five minutes later, 68 dB. Five minutes later, 75. So the drums are getting louder and louder before Jane hits the stage. You don't even notice. People are just tripping out. And it's like, I don't want to play Iggy Pop or, uh, or rock and roll before we go on. Let's get people in a headspace. Let's play them some, some jungle, you know, sound of the jungle. And I always think about the jungle. And you think about African drumming. And then you think about an elephant walking. There it is. They're, they're imitating what they see. You hear a bird, you know, in, the, in the, the feathers in the tree, and then you hear the shaker. And I, I hear the environment in the drumming. And then you go to New York City, and of course the music's gonna be a lot different because there's linear streets and cars and lights. You know, you don't hear the African rhythms of, in New York City. But I love hearing, on that actual jam we just did, none of us are from Africa. None of us have the same record collection, but we all are very similar in that drum tribal conversation. It just happens naturally. And you don't step on each other even though you're flamming. You're not, you're not stopping the flow even though some of, some of us are changing the direction. And I think that's the, the cool thing about drummers and drum circles and playing with other drummers is, is, is watching each other and of course the competition, the competitive spirit, who's going to do what and show off a little, that's always fun. But joining the force together to make this, this combination of sounds, you know, and like I say, it's a celebration. It's conversation, a, really. Yeah, it really is. Percussion discussion. There you, you go. Know? And I, I always think when I do drum circles, I love bringing a kick and a snare. And let them do the hand stuff so I can keep that... that that street, that highway rolling. And it feels good because I feel like, you know when like sharks are swimming and there's other little fish cleaning it? I feel like I'm the shark, you know? And then the little drummers are clamping on and flying away. We have a, uh, a, a great show, it's on Drum Channel and Entertainment, where uh, Gannon Arnold came out yeah. with Taylor Hawkins. Taylor had the sense of courage. He's a courageous drummer. And that's what I hear in his drumming. Fearless. Yeah. And that's really takes the band to another spot. And the band is, you know, because like, if you think about how you propel something, there's always something coming out the back, unless you're surfing. You are propelled by the power of the wave. And it, Taylor's like a wave, you know what I mean? The other band members are surfing on Taylor. He doesn't need any fuel, he doesn't burn, you don't have to refuel it. It's a wave, and, and I always imagine the power of a wave is so different than fueling up a machine and letting that go. You know, you get on a wave and it can throw you for miles at a certain tempo, speed, pace, whatever that wave is breaking. And I think that's kind of where Taylor is, he's like a surfer on drums, you know, he's, he's, he's got this power, he understands the power of the wave, he lets the other band members who are on their own surfboards jump on his wave, and then if they wipe out, he's still a wave, you know? Always gave me the feeling that you were in a club. Yeah. You always felt like this, you're a club and this guy's sitting in and he's, what, he's just going for it. He you is. Know, what, what, what is he gonna do now? What's, what's happening next? And, uh, you know, there's a drummer, to lose, there's been so many great drummers in our community they come and go, you know, we got Neil Peart. Through, through life, Hawk, yeah, many. You know, so many age. great drummers. And I was telling my kid, thank God there's recordings. Because when you think about Beethoven or Mozart, we're not sure exactly how they wanted us to hear it. They wrote it, we have a conductor, and a conductor can do Beethoven's fifth in 12 minutes, Another conductor can do it in 11 minutes and 48 seconds. It's the same piece, because one conductor speeds it up, and one conductor does it slowly. We're not sure how Beethoven would have done it, but we are sure how Neil Peart would have done it, because we can buy the record. Yeah. We're exactly sure how T-Hawk would want us to hear it, because we can buy a Foo Fighters record, or you know any of his uh, other projects, what he did. So I love that we lost our favorites, but there's recordings of them doing what they did best. 
and we can go and listen to John Bonham and Keith Moon and Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa and go, they were alive at one time, and listen to what they did. No one's done it better since. I mean... <laughs> and one commonality all drummers have, no matter what generation you're going to, is they have two hands and they have two feet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they're going to do something with those, and they have one brain yeah. that's going to dictate what your hands and feet are going to do. Um, I was so thankful that we had Taylor out here on several occasions, and you were with him on one of our premiere mm -hmm. interview shows with Chad Smith and Gary Novak, which goes on for over two hours, yeah. talking about life and everything else that has to do with bringing those influences, your life's experiences, into your drumming and how important that is. But yeah. that's something you guys should check out, too, and if you Taylor's have a, a, a great... He likes to turn people on to music. Like I was saying earlier, when I learned the cowbell part, and he sees people get turned on. And he loved that about music, turning people on. And so that, to me, is the gift he gave us. And his, his young son, Shane, is a great drummer. And I, I think we're going to see a lot of wonderful things come out of Shane on the drum set. Yeah, there, there is a DNA, I think. I've said this for years. I think there's got to be some type of a drumming gene that they're <laughs> going to have to find at one point because there's it's too much coincidence, you know, in that situation. The mm -hmm. Wackermans, I mean, we can go on and on. It's like uh, they have their yeah. own uh, interpretation, their own personality that they put into whatever they're doing, mm -hmm. each one of them, even in the Wackerman family. Exactly, uh, they're all but, different. But uh, you got Jay Weinberg and Max, yeah. you know, so yeah. to... Their, their careers went in two different directections musically. However, Jay could sit in with, as he did, and I play know. for a while with Springsteen and cover that gig too. So, uh, But Pop could have sit in I, with Slim. Well, I, I, <laughs> I suggested that instead of going to the gym. Yeah. I said, just go sit in with them for a half yeah, exactly. hour and you've got, oh. your, you've, got your, you've got your workout for sure. Well, um, that's what's great about drumming is like you can see this technical side, this physical side, this athletic side, and, and then there's the music. I mean, there's so much a drummer has. It's such a great instrument, you know? I mean, the music comes first, but all these other things have to come into play to be good at it. You talked, <laughs> a, little bit, you talked a little bit earlier about how music can get you through good times and hard times, and that's part of what we want everybody to experience music because everybody has good times and hard times, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and getting out those sticks and playing for a little while can, or listening to a track that makes you feel really good um, we all have our favorite ones that if you play them, it's going to make you happier. You're yeah. going to forget a lot of the problems yeah. that you might have as life goes on. And you shared with me a track a little bit earlier that kind of touched on both of those things. Uh, good time of the holidays, hard times. Oh, yeah. But explain yeah. a little bit to the audience what we're talking about. Yeah, uh, one of my bands, Porn for Pyros, we haven't worked in 26 years, and we're starting to get the, the mojos coming back. And we had some old songs we never finished. And one was called Pete's Dad. It's a Christmas song. And Peter and Perry went out to dinner together with Pete's family. And they got good news that Peter's father's cancer was in remission. So they picked up a guitar and they, we wrote a song that night. And so the song is about the celebration of life and facing the dark side and whatever the answers might be, if it's not what you want to hear, or possibly it's the best news ever, is taking that and, and using it somehow to celebrate family and life. We put the song in 3-4 or 6-8. It, it tends to move into 4-4 four, four too as well, because they all do. But like all good Christmas songs, they should be in 3-4. And it's just a wonderful piece of music because the lyrics are charming and sad but also so real because, like you said, all of us have good and bad times. And music and art is what separates us from anything else. I mean, think about a person can actually invent and create a computer or the Eiffel Tower or a jet engine or a Camco pedal. And these are things that we get to use to improve our life and, and feel better about you know, why we're here and what we're doing here. So that song is really a celebration of why we're here, what we're doing in this time, and what we do with each other in the time on, on Earth. So Pete's Dad is the name of the tune. Uh, I played an Udu drum. That's the, the clay drum with the hole. Sure. I played Udu. I used a 16-inch floor tom with a towel over it, with the Ringo effect. Um, a very dry snare drum and some 13-inch hi-hats. And that was my drum kit. 
We have Lily Hayden playing violin. And it's just a wonderful piece of music to think that the band's been asleep for 27 years and to come up with music like this makes me feel good because I want to share it with people. And that's really the, the great moment when you make a song or you make a, a product, you want to share it with people. It's like you don't want to hide it because you're not proud of it. You want to share. And so that's the greatest thing about this band right now is Porno for Pyros has new music. Last month we released a song called Agua and it's about saving the earth and saving water. And this song's about Pete's dad. And um, you know, that's the, the charm of music is what you do with it and who gets to hear it. You know, it's not like the old days, a great record store, and you sit and you look at your records and you, oh, the, all the notes and where they recorded a lot. Phone, but it's there and people can hear your music and they can hear it anywhere. And I, I think it's cool because music, you can be in, a, in Jamaica on a boat and you can hear Bob Marley and it's normal, that's what they listen to. But you can also be in Jamaica, New York mm -hmm. and hear Bob Marley and it's, it's, it's meant to be. So, uh, you know, music to me is a global experience and I think Pete's dad hits that. You can also read this entire article. Something, this is gonna be news for you too. Okay. Uh, I should have asked you this before we got on, but I'll ask <laughs> you live here now. Um, we'd like to have you honored in our January cover of, uh, of our newsletter for the month of January. And we'll be transcribing this interview so you can read it if you don't have the opportunity to, to be That's watching cool. it at the same I'm time honored. too. I, answers uh, yes over and over. Right. And if they, uh, anything I can do to help get it done, you know, if you need to find out what is he talking about? Some mm -hmm. editing notes. I can I can clarify. No, we can we can hear everything you're talking about. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's for sure because it's what a what a what a history you have going back to. You must have been. I'm really far out guessing now. Early twenty with Jane's Addiction. Jane's Addiction started. I was seventeen. Seventeen. Wow. Nineteen eighty six. Right out of high school. And it was we made it. If we had a good gig, we made it. Of course, it didn't pay your bills, it didn't change your life, but we played well. And every time we played well, I felt like there was something about the band. We had something, we had a purpose. And that was, that was really what it felt like, we had purpose. And our singer being 10 years older than me, you gotta imagine a 26 year old wanting to play music with a 17 year old, you know, and the lyrics, that's why his lyrics to me were so different because he was writing poems and he was a young man and I was still a teenager. So the poems really opened my eyes and like you said, what are you gonna do with a drum beat if you have lyrics like this? So I had the opportunity to play with a great bass player, Dave Navarro, a great guitar player, Perry, this great lyricist. And I had to rise to that occasion. So I had chops and I had the machine gun drum fills but what musical, how was I gonna be musically? And so that's what that band really brought to my attention. Be a musician, write lyrical drum parts, write musical drum parts, and yeah, show off like every drummer has a right to. Who were your favorite, <laughs> who were your favorite drummers back in those days who you should be watching also in these days? Well, when I first got into drums, it was only strictly jazz drummers. And Baxter Northrup was my, my, my shop that I, took my lessons, a guy named Jim Engel, and Pro Drum actually published his books. I still have his, his uh, yeah, Rock in Time, Jazz in Time, Swing in Time, Latin Time. But uh, so jazz drumming was the goal. But no one in LA that I knew played piano, upright bass, or saxophone. So everyone had plugged in their Ampeg and their Marshall. So the volume of a, of a the, the power that a drummer has on the acoustic situation and the dynamics you have with a piano and an upright bass player, that went out the window. I had to go to match grip and start playing rock and roll, but I love swing, I love jazz. I love hearing what Elvin was doing in that conversation. I love hearing Buddy lay it down so precise. There's no doubt that's the way it's supposed to be done. I mean, I love that. And the second trumpet player <laughs> better be with him. <laughs> yeah, exactly, snap. But um, going into rock and roll, you know, there was Ginger Baker and Bonham and Bill Ward from Black Sabbath, and these guys were still swinging. 
but they were playing loud music. You know, the Beatles and the Stones were rocking, but the music wasn't as loud as what I was hearing in my Valley Band. They were plugging in and they were playing Black Sabbath, ACDC. So the volume and the power of the drummer had to change from that jazz essence into the rock outfit. But I was somewhere between there. And you know, I wanted to swing, but I wanted to play hard rock music. And then, you know, the you did both, however. I've got to say, jump in and say that because that's something that's, I think, really important. We've talked yeah. about a lot here on Drum Channel. Swing music, jazz music, people would think of it as a style or a genre. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of a, of a feel. Exactly. And look at it's a feel. if you're playing straight eighth notes in a regular rock beat, it swings as yeah. opposed to somebody that might not be swinging when they're playing that. So I try to swing, and sometimes producers will ask me to swing less. You know, can you straighten it out a little? You know, it's too much feel. Sure. But okay, I get. I hear what you're saying. You know, uh, to the producer. But yeah, the the great rock drummers at the beginning only had jazz records to listen to, so they were all swinging. And if you were to look back, I've asked this question of, of a lot of guys, um, at your experience you have now, compared to being 17. Mm. Would you have done things a little differently on some of those records, or would you, you know, how would you have had your maturity been added to that? Because if you're coming back together again, the guys better look out because they're going to have a Steve Perkins that's got everything he had then plus another twenty some odd years. Well, thank you for saying that. There is that great challenge playing the songs live with the endurance and stamina and the power and urgency you had at eighteen. But why did you write it like that? the courage, like the Taylor Hawkins courage. Why did you take those chances? Would you be so bold to try those things? And I think the answer is yes, you know, I would be. You were possibly so naive at the time, you didn't know, you were you just. You didn't, you didn't. And uh, you know, and a lot of people thought drummers were replaced on records. A lot of bands didn't have a drummer that was good enough in the studio. And I didn't understand that philosophy because that would make all the bands sound the same if you use studio drummers, but I get it now. As a drummer, if you can't hold it together in the studio, it's very obvious you don't want to hear the record over and over, even a great song. So the, the challenge that I had as a 17, 18, and 19 year old to perform in a studio, that was new to me. Now that pressure changes, it's a studio, and that's not good, because you want to bring that that essence, that fire into the studio, you know? So I have my own home studio, which is great because I can study and microscope my drumming. I can record stuff, no one's around. I can go into the, into the, you know, the engine room and listen to it and, and wonder why or how I got there or should I never go there again without anybody you know, around. So I do have time to, to microscope and explore myself, but I'm, I'm I'm a better drummer, I, I have better choices, better gear, and, and better people around me, and a better understanding of what that mix is, that full frequency mix the, the, of what the ears can handle. And now I know I don't have to do all this all the time, I can do it here and there. You think John Bonham, the very first Zeppelin record, Days of Confused and Your Time is Gonna Come, and some of these great drum parts, very busy. What would happen if they recorded those 10 years later when they did their last record? Because he was so simple on the last records. I wonder what he would have done with those songs. Both versions of Bonham are perfect. But you can see in 10 years a growth, a maturity, a less flash, more backbeat, you know? And even in Bonham, in, in eight, nine records, you see that growth. And I just, I want to grow like that. I want to hear myself grow. And I got better. I got, I got better musically. I understood what to do. I hear Pete's dad. I like what I did. When they I'm, talk, I'm a talkative drummer, though. And by the way, <laughs> you mentioned the Christmas you know, song. Yeah. It's a song that makes you feel good any time of the year. Don't That's have to true, yeah. Just at, just at Christmas. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got to put it out for Christmas. But I hear that drum part, and it's talkative. It's busy. I'm everywhere, but that's me. It sounds like me. You said it. So that's good news. You know, I want to get better, but I also don't want to abandon what I worked for, me. I work to get my sound. I've got a, uh, a firing line of questions for you here, which okay. I haven't done live before on Lombardi Live, usually because you're going to be the cover of our January newsletter. Um, 
we would approach you, you know, outside of, of the interview and just ask you these questions. But I'll put you on the hot seat. Yeah, now. what's so, that? So, okay. Uh, we'll kind of zing through them. Your favorite destination? Tahiti. Ah. What uh, are you, when are you most creative, morning or night? Mornings. Favorite song to play, if you had to pick one? Thank You by Led Zeppelin. If you could put together a, you've already put together a dream collab, but if you put, put together another dream collab with other musicians, what would you think it would be? Mm. I would write, I'd love to get my hands on a piano player and an upright bass player. Now, as far as what year and genre, I'm not sure. But I want to get my drum set next to a piano and a bass player upright. And I love the dynamic that that conversation will have. That's I should get Lee Scalar to bring out his upright bass again and get it going. So That would be great. Lee's a swan. Uh, <laughs> if you didn't play drums, is there another instrument that would be, or what is your second instrument now, I guess I would say? I would say piano. There's nothing better than bringing a room to life behind a piano. I, I think it's just magic. Starbucks order. <laughs> Are you a Starbucks person? <laughs> You're good. I've, I've gone into matcha latte lately. Okay. I'm, I'm a matcha guy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, favorite food? You have a or, or type of food? Yeah, I, Italian food. I did hey. a trip. I did a trip to uh, Italy about two months ago, and we were in Verona, Roma. We were in, I think, Florence for a day, Venice for two days, and it was just such a great trip all around. The food, the people, the flavors, the smells. You into food treats? So you got a you got a uh, a sugar spot there where you like to have specials. Is the dessert kind of thing? Or? You know, to me, it's also going back to uh, Italiano, tiramisu. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're finishing the whole thing up. Um, what time do you go to bed at night? Are you a late nighter? or? Well, I tell people I'm 9 to 5, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. That's, that's my work schedule. <laughs> uh, and just in, in general, some words of wisdom to share to young drummers out there. It's a new, it's a new life. It's a new world for them. Every generation has its challenges. Yeah. Um, we often talk. They have to expand beyond the boundaries, as you have, being a songwriter and a producer. And but uh, anything that you'd like to say to the absolutely. To the kids? I mean, I am also a young drummer. I'm also an amateur. I'm striving to be the better me best me I could be. My best playing usually happens when I'm alone in my drum room, not in front of an audience or with the band or in the studio. So don't forget it's an intimate love affair between you and your hands and the sticks. And when I was eight, this is what I did. And when I'm 98, this is what I'm going to do. Just play from your heart and don't worry if anybody likes you or doesn't like you. You're doing it because you like it. And if you do that, people are going to like it. There you go. Because yeah. everybody I know loves you, Stephen, as, well, as do I and everybody here. Thank you. Thank man. you so much for coming and joining us today. Here too, which will be really fun too. Yeah. Keep drumming. See you next Lombardi Live. <laughs>